Yes. How are you doing, Summit Park? Everybody doing all right today? Man, it's great to see all of you here. I want to take a minute. I want to welcome everybody who is watching online. And, of course, everybody who's over at our South Side, South Campus, South Campus. We love you. Come on, North Campus. Can we welcome Southside and everybody who's watching online? All right, man. This is, this is a great season, man. I love, I love December. I love Christmas. Man, we were in the throes of it. Um, if you haven't heard yet in this service, which you've heard a few times, we have Christmas adventure happening this week, all right? So it's going to be amazing. Great chance, great opportunity, not only to make a memory, but to bless the community. And honestly, I'm going to talk about that just for a moment, because that's why we exist as a church, right? We want, we want to experience God's goodness, and then we want to be a conduit. We say that we are blessed to be a blessing. That's right. We are blessed to be a blessing. We want to help and encourage as many people as possible. So this week really gives us a great opportunity to do that. I'm super pumped. And then, of course, the services and, and all of the great things that we have going on. Uh, super thankful to be a part of a church that wants to be the hands and feet of Jesus, making a difference for those who need to know uh, all about uh, God and his goodness. Well, we're jumping right back in to a series that we've been going through over the last several weeks called God Encounters. And the whole idea for this series is that one moment can change every other moment of our life. Like moments matter because moments can impact us, right? Moments change the way we view things. They change the way we go about things. Moments really, really matter. And it's kind of like the moment that you have on Cyber Monday, right? You guys know the moment I'm talking about? Like you realize the thing that you bought on Black Friday now was actually cheaper. <laughs> And you're like, I think I'm going to have to get two of them. Like, you just end up buying two of them. Like, that moment's a good moment, you know. And, and so it's like one moment can, can have an impact on every other moment of our life. Massive things happen in moments. Now, what we've been talking about is obviously this happens for the believer, for the person who's following God. When you start putting your faith in Jesus, when you move over from darkness to light, from unbelief to belief, this is a moment that changes every other moment. Like it literally is like you're watching life in black and white, and now you step into it, and it's like it's color, all right? Everything you see, all the vibrancies of life, that's, that's salvation. That's the first moment. But what we've been talking about in this series is God never made uh, or never intended this for us just to have one moment and then be like, all right, I'll check y'all later. I'll see you when you get to heaven. God wants us to have moments every single day of our life where he's speaking vision, where he's speaking hope, where he's speaking encouragement, where he's completely changing the game all over again for each of us. So that's what we're talking about in this series, having God encounters. It's an encounter that leaves us completely different, all right? And so we've been talking about uh, peace and how that's a byproduct of having a God encounter. We've talked about how having hope is a byproduct. The last time we were in this series a couple weeks ago, we talked about how worship is the response for having an encounter with God, all right? Now I want to talk about the person who's making this whole thing happen. Who's the person? Who are we actually encountering? Who's the person who's really the cause of all of this encounter? And his name is the Holy Spirit. His name is the Holy Spirit. Now, as soon as I say that, some of you just get really excited. You're like, oh, yeah, Red Bull. Like, you get, like, super pumped up. You're like, yeah, because you come, like, from a Pentecostal background, you know. And then, and, and then, and then others, like, who maybe don't come from a Pentecostal background, you just kind of grab your seat a little bit because you're getting nervous. You're like, oh, no, honey, grab your purse. We're going to leave as soon as you read the scripture. You know, like, we do not want to be around these charismatics when they start talking about that. Woo, Holy Spirit. Like, we just do not want to be around it. Because they get a little crazy, all right? And, uh, and I get it. I get it, right? Because God the Father, like, okay, we make, that makes sense. Like, we ha somebody had to create this thing. So God the Father, he's the creator, all right? We can look at him like, okay, he's, he kind of spoke. Okay, he's there. And then the son, Jesus, we're cool with Jesus because, like, he kind of related to us, right? He get, became one of us, you know, and Jesus walks and he walks with us, okay? So we're, like, we're relating to him. But the Holy Spirit, 
that's just weird. You know, <laughs> like you think about spirit. And then growing up, a lot of us called him the Holy Go- Oh, okay, so a lot of us did in this service. <laughs> a lot of us in this service. We call him the Holy Ghost. How many know if you're new? That's even more weird. It's like, oh, the whole, I mean, and sometimes people get like that with the Holy Spirit, right? Like, it's like, and so, and then people start talking about, like, they hear from God, and God speaks to them, and God told me, and they have that kind of crazy look in their eye, and and you're like, cool, see you later, (laughs) you know? Like, Holy Spirit, it's just, it can be a little bit different, right? It could be a little bit weird. People hear from the Holy Spirit. We welcome the Holy Spirit. Who is this person called the Holy Spirit? I want to talk about him today because, really, when we talk about having a God encounter, the Holy Spirit is the one who makes that possible, And the Holy Spirit is actually who we're encountering. And as we talked about in our Holy Spirit series, that's not weird. It's wonderful because he's not odd. He's awesome. All right. So turn to someone and say, he's awesome. He's awesome. He is. It's not weird. It's nothing to be afraid of. Um, And I want to talk. So I want to just do a little uh, Holy Spirit tour today. And I want to talk about the fact that he's God just as much as God the Father is God, just as much as Jesus the Son is God. They are all different, but they are all one, and they are all uniquely God all together. And he's been a part of this whole journey uh, of, of, of Godhead. He's been a part of that from the very beginning. He is God. He was there at the beginning. And so I want to do a little journey. All right, I want to go on a little journey with us, and, and we're going to walk away uh, uh, better understanding who he is and why we should want to have an encounter with the Holy Spirit. So if you're ready or if you're at least willing to give it a shot, say, I am. All right, let's jump in. Genesis chapter 1. I want to show you how he's right there at the very beginning. It says this, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the, come on, everybody say it with me, spirit of God was hovering. He's hovering. He's hovering over the waters. Now, the word uh, spirit in Hebrew is the word ruach. Everybody say ruach. Ruach. It, it means air in motion. And it's, it's the word for breath, and it also means life. Okay, so now track with me just for a minute. So the idea is that when God speaks, when God, when the Spirit of God moves, it's like the breath of God. So when God speaks, things happen. When God speaks, the universe gets created. Like mankind gets created. Cool things like the Rocky Mountains. Come on, somebody gets created. Or like the beaches of Florida. You know, that's a little bit more my style. Like things happen like that. Summer gets created. Come on, somebody. And how many of you know winter? That's just part of curse creation. The devil was all up in that. Okay, so Jesus had nothing to do with that. But the Spirit of God, he brings, he brings life. And that's exactly what he wants to do in our lives, and he's been doing it from the very beginning. He, he renews, he creates, he lifts, he builds. And so what the Bible says at the very beginning, God and man walked together, their spirits walked together in perfect harmony. That's the Garden of Eden. What made the Garden of Eden amazing wasn't just that it was probably 82 degrees, because that's the perfect temperature. Uh, probably just wasn't just because it was tropical, but because it was, it was God and man in unhindered communion, where the spirits were intermixing, were, were interacting, were conversing, were dwelling together in perfect harmony. That's what the Bible teaches the Garden of Eden was like. But then what we find out is Adam and Eve, uh, they, they kind of mess it all up for us, right? The original sin comes in, and separation happens. And now our spirits are actually separated. And, but right at that moment, God says, hey, listen, I'm going to make a moment that will bring this moment back into fruition. I, 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 I want this. This is what I ultimately want, but I'm going to take you all on a journey 
And it's going to seem really, really long to you, but it's going to seem just like this to me because God exists outside of time. So he's going to, the people are going to go on a journey, and you can see all throughout the Old Testament where God would give moments of his spirit, but all of it's pointing to the moment when we'll have many moments with his spirit. So you have moments in the Old Testament, moments like Joseph, where God shows up and gives him dreams. The spirit of God gives him dreams. Or Gideon, God shows up and gives him courage. Or Samson shows up and he gives him supernatural strength. A lot of people think like Samson was, was you know, just like Arnold Schwarzenegger or something like that. Like he walked around saying, I will break you. You know, like doing like all kinds of things. Like, But that's, I don't think that's uh, Samson at all. I think Samson's probably looked a, a lot more like me, if I could just be completely honest. And then when he's doing all these amazing feats of strength, people are like, man, only God could do that. Like, see, like, that's, that's the spirit of God. But it, what happens is so there's moments of God showing up. But ultimately, God's saying, what I really want to do is be with you doing this all the time and everywhere. That's, that's what God's heart is. And so there's a few prophecies that happen in the Old Testament that keep us hungry for this day when we're going to get back to the original day. One of them is Joel chapter 2. It says this in verse 28, And afterward I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy, and your old men will dream dreams, and your young men will see visions. And even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and I will show wonders in the heavens and on the earth. Come on, somebody. That sounds pretty great. That sounds pretty original. That sounds Garden of Eden. Ezekiel 36 says this, and I will put my spirit in you. In you, he will live in you and, and, and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. And then you will live in the land and I gave your ancestors. You will be my people and I will be your God. What does that sound like? That sounds like the way it started, doesn't it? It sounds like the original intent. It sounds like Garden of Eden. It sounds pretty stinking amazing. If all of this stuff is true. If God really is the creator of the universe, if he did speak the world into existence, if he does want relationship with us, and that's the potential we have, it's pretty stinking cool. And so God says, hey, listen, I'm going to get us back to that. Don't you worry. I'm going to get us back to that. I'm going to give you little moments that's going to prepare us for the one moment that where we'll experience many moments, how it was all originally intended to be. But what's amazing is, is God prophesies, and then it's almost like there's, you hear nothing in the Old Testament for hundreds of years. It's, it's almost like, I like to look at it like this. I like to look at it like God takes this dramatic pause. You know, like sometimes like when you're getting ready to say something, you want to get like dramatic emphasis, you'll just get ready and you'll be like, and now. Like this is like what I feel like God's doing in the Old Testament. He's preparing everybody. Da, 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 signs, wonders. There's moments and there's prophecies. And then it's like nothing. He's dramatic pause. He's like, mm. And then you know what happens? Christmas. Christmas. That's why this series is perfect for Christmas. Because Christmas is the arrival of the Holy Spirit in action again. Like, this is exactly what happens. Uh, you can see it. It starts right in the beginning uh, of uh, Luke, chapter 1. There's, a, there's this guy. His name's Zechariah. He's a priest, and he gets this once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to go burn incense at the altar. It's kind of a cool privilege. So he goes in, and this angel shows up. And, like, you're going to give birth to a son. You haven't been able to give birth to a son, but you're going to give birth to a son. And he's going to be amazing, and he's going to point the way to the one who is going to bring the Holy Spirit back online. Watch this, Luke chapter 1, verse 14. He will be a joy. This is the angel speaking to Zechariah. He will be a joy and a delight to you, and many will rejoice because of his birth, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He's never to take wine or any other fermented drink. We're going to set him apart but he is going to be filled with the Holy Spirit even before he's born. Now, this is amazing because there's been nothing that's been happening for hundreds of years. And now God shows up and says, and guess what? 
Someone is going to be filled with the Holy Spirit even before they're born. Now, here's the thing. Do you know John the Baptist, Zechariah's son, he's got one job. He's a guy who's supposed to point the way to the guy. He's a man who's supposed to lift up the man. And that man is Jesus. And John, John shows up and he's pointing the way. But even, even before Jesus is born, the Holy Spirit is moving. Matthew chapter 1, this is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph. But before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Now that's crazy. I mean, can we just be honest, church, like that, that sounds crazy to every person who hears it. Like even people who believe it, it sounds crazy. And it's definitely impossible. And that's exactly what the Holy Spirit is bringing online. Think about it for a moment. Crazy impossibilities that now will become normal. That's what the Holy Spirit, I mean, so from the very beginning, he's bringing this online. He's saying, I want to move in your life. I want you to be in awe. I want you to say, there's no way that could have happened. And God be like, that's right. There is no way except for the Holy Spirit. Now, Jesus' ministry right out of the beginning, right out of the gate is filled with the Holy Spirit. Luke chapter 4, Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, left the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. So Jesus, who is fully God, he's full of the Spirit, and he's led by the Spirit. And then the ministry of Jesus is marked by the Spirit. Um, miracle provision, divine knowledge, wisdom, teaching with authority, literally God, his power on display, walking on water, water into wine. The Holy Spirit is moving like how? Like he did at the beginning. Do you see it? God is bringing back the personal presence, the intimacy of relationship, and it's all made possible by the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, here, what Jesus is doing, he's, ult he's making us right so that we can experience the Holy Spirit. Now, that's really what he's doing, so that we can experience God, his presence, that we can experience eternity with God, but not just eternity with God, but heaven right here, right now. And Jesus, Jesus walks with his disciples, and he's telling them all these things. He's like, hey, now here's the deal, guys. We got to go to Jerusalem because I'm going to have to die, and you're all probably going to die too, and it's going to be really, really bad. And uh, they're all like, no, let's not do that. I don't like that plan. He's like, that's the plan. And he's like, and, 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 and they're like, we're trying to stop him. And he's like, no, this needs to happen. And they're like, Jesus, we kind of like you. We like having you around. We like all these miracles. We like all of this stuff. And he says, if you like me, wait till you meet the Holy Spirit. Because what Jesus was able to do was, was be the, the visible and personal representation of God in moments. But what what, what Jesus is saying is, I'm going to step away, and you're going to have him all the time. You're going to experience this stuff all of the time. John chapter 14, uh, Jesus is in encouraging his disciples and right before he goes to die, and he says this, Very truly, I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works I've been doing, and they will do even greater things than these. Because I am going to the Father. And I will do whatever you ask in my name so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. You may ask me anything in my name, and I will do it. If you love me, keep my commands, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever. Who is this advocate? Who is this helper? The Spirit of truth, the Holy Spirit. The world can't accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he lives with you and he will be in you. Man, that sounds a lot like Ezekiel prophesied. Do you remember that? We just talked about that mm, like four and a half minutes ago. For these disciples, it was hundreds of years, but he's saying, now listen, I'm getting you back to the beginning. And it's all made possible because of the power 
of the Holy Spirit. He says, all this I've spoken while still with you, but the advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. Jesus promises a helper. He promises someone who will, who will walk with us, who will live with us, who will guide us, who will protect us and get us back to how this whole thing was originally intended where we experience the Holy Spirit on the daily. So here's what I want to do. I want to give you just a couple of things. We could do a whole series on this. We did do a whole series on this a, a year and a half ago. You can go online and watch it. But we, we could do a whole series. But I want to give you some basics of the Holy Spirit so that you can know how he's moving in your life and what he wants to accomplish in your life. And so that as all of us go through this next uh, holiday Christmas season, we'll have the encounter of the Holy Spirit uh, each and every day of our life. And it sounds pretty good if you believe it. Say, I do. Yeah. All right. Uh, we're going to jump into a few things, what the Holy Spirit does. Let me give you the first thing. And the first thing is this. The Holy Spirit convicts us of sin. Now, as soon as I say that, some of you are like, man, that, that doesn't sound fun. Man, I thought you said it was going to be fun, life-giving, like creating. I want to get back to the Garden of Eden. Now this whole sin thing, like, not fun. Like, <laughs> what are we talking about that? Let me, let me explain this, because actually what he's doing is getting us to the fun, but he has to start by doing a little bit of surgery in our heart, and he convicts us of sin. Now, I want to break this down. We use this term convict a lot in Christianity. Have you ever noticed this? Like, even like, you can know when someone says, like, you can know if someone's got a church background by if they say, oh, I feel really convicted right now. How many know, like, the world never says I feel convicted, like, about anything? They, they don't feel convicted about anything. But, 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 but Christians, we say we're convicted. Where does this come from? Have you ever thought, like, where does this come from? Let me show you where it comes from. John 16. This is the same conversation Jesus is having with his disciples in John 14, right before he goes to the cross. Same conversation. John 16, he says this in verse 8. When he comes, the Holy Spirit, he will prove the world to be in the wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment about sin because people do not believe in me. Okay, you say, Scott, you didn't help me with the whole convict thing. Like, what, what, where is this coming from? In the New King James uh, Version, if some of you have that Bible with you, or the King James Version, if you grew up reading that, it says, the Holy Spirit will convict the world of sin. So that's where it comes from. He will prove the world of sin. He will prove, he will convict the world of sin. Now, here's the deal. In secular society... Watch this. This is really important. We use the term convict in a legal sense, like we're sending someone to jail, right? Like we're going to send someone to, so the judge will convict and we'll do the, the little gavel, which, you know, law and order goes, dong, dong. Like, you know, it's like, dong, dong. It's like the coolest sound. I'm, sometimes I'll binge law and order. I'll be admitted. All right. It's con confession time. I love that. Dong, dong. Okay. So like sometimes like the, the judge will convict. And, and so, but what the Holy Spirit does, he doesn't convict us to send us to prison. What he does is actually the opposite. His main job is to convict us to show us that we don't have to be in the spiritual prison that sin puts us in. He, he doesn't want us to stay in that prison. Because how many of you know that when we sin, we become slaves to sin? That's what Jesus said. He said, when you sin, you become a slave to sin. It's like you literally enter a spiritual prison. What the Holy Spirit does is he comes and he says, I want to convict you so that you can live in the freedom that Jesus has brought about on the cross for you. Because God doesn't want you to live in your sin. He wants you to be free of your sin. Now, here's the thing. A lot of times we don't know, we don't know the cause of the prison that we find ourselves in. We see hopelessness, we see the effects, but we don't know the cause. We see hopelessness, we see a lack of joy, we see a lack of peace, but we don't know that it's all brought down to that original moment that screwed up the Garden of Eden called sin. So what the Holy Spirit does, he says, I want to convict you of sin. And what ultimately Jesus is saying, he's saying, what you, what the Holy Spirit will do in all of our hearts, he's going to say, you need a savior, and you can't save yourself. 
There's that moment, have you ever been in church? Have you ever heard scriptures? Have you ever been in a worship service where you're like, man, I need God. That's the spirit of God convicting us, pushing and saying, you need Jesus. So he convicts us of sin. That's the first thing. But the second thing he does is the Holy Spirit convicts us of sins, plural. And you're like, Scott, this message isn't getting any better. You know, it's just like one more like, you know, demoralizing thing. It actually is because it's not just a one-time thing that the Holy Spirit convicts us of. But what he's trying to do is to keep us from going back to the spiritual prison that we've been set free from. So what he does is he'll be like, hey, listen, you don't need to be doing that. Like, when you start following God and you read the Bible and you're opening yourself up to the, the power of the Holy Spirit, he is going to push on your life and he's going to be like, hey, listen, you don't need to be doing that. Hey, listen, the way you talk to that person, it was inappropriate. It was unkind. It was uncalled for. Hey, you need to ask for forgiveness in that situation. Hey, the, w- what you're looking at, the activities that you're participating in, you got to stop that because it is keeping you from all that God has for you. He's not trying to make you feel bad. He's trying to make you feel best. This is what the Holy Spirit does. And he will convict and he will say, you're settling and God has more for you. He's not trying to limit you. He's trying to get you from limiting yourself. He's not holding you back. He's setting you free. And when he convicts, he always prompts us. Here's something that's really important. When he convicts us, he always prompts us to moving forward. This is how you know it's the Spirit of God. Watch this in Romans chapter 8. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. So the Spirit doesn't condemn. He convicts because he wants to prompt us to change. Because he says, you've, he's like a coach. Do you see this? He's like, come on, you can do better than that. You're better than that. God's, God's in you. He wants better for you. So don't give in to this because God has this for you. And here's how you know it's the Holy Spirit. If you, if you feel terrible so that you want to give up, that's the enemy. But if you feel motivated, that makes you want to step up, that's the Holy Spirit. A lot of people are like, I don't know if it's God or if it's the enemy. The enemy always wants to make you throw in the towel. And the spirit always wants to make you run the race. It always says, listen, you're better. God's got more for you. The best is yet to come. Let's actually go. That's the spirit. That's the spirit. So the spirit convicts of sin. He convicts of sins. And then now... Here's the good, maybe even good news, a little more, more encouraging. The Holy Spirit helps us when we need it. The Holy Spirit helps us when we need it. Do you know when you go to, the, like, the bookstore, like, probably maybe one of the biggest sections is the self-help section. And it's interesting because the self-help section just seems to continue to grow and grow and grow, and yet so do our issues. Right? Like with all of the books and all of the education and all of the, the resources in the world, we're not getting any better when we're trying to fix ourselves. What we don't need is self-help. What we need is spirit help. And the spirit help can actually help. Like the spirit wants to help you overcome temptation. The spirit wants to help you when you're struggling with heavy burdens. He's going to come and bring bring encouragement and strength. When you're frustrated, the spirit can help you. When you're worked up, when you're ready to, to get angry, the spirit can calm you. He can calibrate our emotional health. He can give you wisdom and favor and grace and strength. And then he gives us comfort. The Holy Spirit gives us comfort. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 3 says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in our troubles so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves receive from God. Do you know that the Holy Spirit, he comforts us? So when you're going through it, when you're struggling, You reach out to God and you say, God, I can't do this on my own. Do you know who answers? Do you know who shows up? It's the Holy Spirit. 
and, he's, and he tells you it's going to be okay, and God is with you, and he's not going to forsake you, and he's not forgotten you, and he's got great things for you. This is the Holy Spirit. And maybe one of the best things that the Holy Spirit does, and we'll wrap up our time with this, and we'll get, we're going to to have a moment of worship, is that the Holy Spirit reminds us that we are children of God. The Holy Spirit reminds us that we are children. And the reason he needs it, didn't he say that? In, didn't we just read that? The Holy Spirit will remind you. He's going to remind you. Do you know why the Holy Spirit needs to remind us? Because we're so good at forgetting. We're so good at forgetting. And we believe the lies of the enemy so easily. And he speaks so loudly. And he brings condemning thoughts. And the Spirit says, no, you are a child of God. If you're a, if you're a follower of God, if you've accepted Jesus into your heart, and you said, I'm gonna move, I want to make Jesus the Lord of my life, then you are no longer bound by sin and controlled by the enemy. You have been set free. And Jesus says, he who the Son sets free is free indeed. And the Holy Spirit comes and reminds us of that powerful truth. John 16, 15, he says, if you love me, you will keep my commands and I will ask the Father and he will give you another advocate. Again, this word advocate, to help you and be with you forever, the spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor know him, but you know him for he lives with you and he will be in you. Then verse 18 says this, I will not leave you as orphans and I will come to you. The Holy Spirit reminds us Romans chapter 8 says this, the Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Galatians 4 says, because you are his sons, God sent the Spirit of his Son into our hearts. The Spirit who calls out, Abba, Father. See, the Spirit reminds you this, that word Abba means daddy. It's like daddy. It's like this kid who's, like, who's just totally enamored and, and overwhelmed by the goodness of their father. It says, daddy. Oh. I love you. I need something. Will you help me? The Spirit reminds you that's available. That's online. That's what, he, that he, that's what God wants for you. See, the enemy comes to condemn, but the Spirit is our advocate. Again, it's this legal term, right? Advocate. It's almost like it's almost like the Spirit of God is, is our defense attorney. Like the enemy comes and, and he's the prosecutor. And he says, and, and God's the judge. And the enemy comes and he says, well, yeah, but look what all they did. They did this and they did that and they did this and they did that. And the, he looks at us and we're like, yeah, we're guilty of all of those things. And the Spirit says, objection. I've always wanted to say objection in a court of law. Like, wouldn't it be like the most baller thing, like to say objection? Like, and then, and for the judge to be sustained. Like, that's just like the coolest thing. I just, I don't think I had to handle it maturely. I think I'd look at the other guy and be like, every time. That's right. You know, I think, like, I just, I just, be, I just get way too into it. Do you know? That when the enemy's bringing all of his accusations, and he's right, he's saying, you've done, you've been, you are, you were, and you just, you have nothing else to do but just put your head down, the Holy Spirit raises up, and he says, objection. And the Father gladly says, sustained. Come on, isn't that so stinking good? He reminds us that we're God's child and that we're not orphans anymore. A pastor shared a story one time of a family who had adopted this boy and he'd been bounced around from home to home to home uh, before he got to their home. So he was like kind of a perennial orphan. Got to their, got to their home, they'd, they'd adopted him and so they'd brought him in as part of their family and 
And, uh, but it was just a short while before they realized they'd put him to bed in his pajamas. But when they went to go wake him up in the morning, he was fully dressed with his shoes on. And so they, they didn't want to, like, make him feel weird, so they didn't ask him the first time or the second time. But after a few times, they wanted, they wanted to, to talk to him about it. But as they were cleaning out his room, they were cleaning up his room, they, they, they found snacks stored everywhere. This kid was storing snacks. And so they, they're like, we need to sit down. We need to have a talk about this. Like, what do, why, you know, why are you dressed, fully dressed every morning, and why are there snacks all over your room. He goes, well, I'm just ready so that when I get up in the morning, because I know I'm going to leave, and when I, I want to be ready when I leave, and, and, and when we run out of food, I, I don't want to go hungry, so I store the snacks. He was, he was adopted, but he was living with, a, with an orphan mindset, right? And his, his, his parents just grabbed him and were like, listen, you, you are never leaving this house again. You, 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 are, you are ours. You are part of this family. We're never kicking you out. And you are never going hungry ever, ever again. And it's such a powerful illustration of what the Holy Spirit does to us. Because we are adopted when we give our lives to Christ, but we forget, don't we? And he comes and he reminds us and he says, no, no, no. Don't go back to that. Don't live like that. You don't have to live with the world's food and chasing after the world's thing. No, no, you can eat at the king's table. And you will never, ever thirst or hunger again. You have the richest of fare. You have the most substantial of food. Because you're, because you're dining with the king of kings and the Lord of lords and the one who spoke the world into existence calls you his own calls you his own. How's all that? How's all that happen? It happens because of the power of the Holy Spirit, his voice, his encouragement, and his presence in our lives. So how do we experience him? How do we experience this amazing power of the Holy Spirit? Number one, I want, I want to encourage you to do this. Lift up the name of Jesus. Lift up the name of Jesus. The Spirit always is glorifying the Son. That's what he does. He glorifies the Son. He lifts up Christ. Christ is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. He's what this whole thing's about. So you start worshiping Jesus. That's why we praise Jesus. Because as we praise Jesus, we're fulfilling our purpose, and the Spirit is right there. So lift up the name of Jesus. Turn to Jesus. Turn away from your sin and turn towards Jesus, and you will find the Spirit right there. He'll actually be helping all of that happen. And then second, spend time in the presence of God. This is why prayer matters, the Bible matters, worship matters. It's not just religious activity. It's the means by which we experience the presence and the power and the activity of God in our lives. So I want to encourage you, spend some time, scratch out some time, simmer in his presence a little bit. Let him speak to you. Don't just go through life, but, but soak him in. And then third, ask him to lead every aspect of your life. You ask him to lead, and he will. Say, Spirit, lead me. You're going into a meeting. Spirit, lead me. You're getting ready to uh, interact with your kids. Spirit, lead me. To discipline your kids. Spirit, lead me. At work, with your spouse, with your neighbors, wherever you are, Spirit, lead me. Spirit, lead me. And he will give you the wisdom, the grace, and the strength to do what God has put in your heart to do. It's exactly who he is and is what, he's, is what he does. He is, the, he is the way maker. And we experience all of that because of his spirit. So I'm going to ask the worship team to come. And I'm going to ask you to stand right here.